Listener note. This episode contains graphic language and adult content. Listener discretion is advised. This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 478. David Goggins never finished. Unshackle your mind and win the war within. Good morning and welcome to the 5 a.m. Miracle. I am Jeff Sanders and this is the podcast dedicated to dominating your day before breakfast. My goal is to help you bounce out of bed with enthusiasm, create powerful lifelong habits, and tackle your grandest goals with extraordinary energy. In the episode this week, I'll break down David Goggins' latest book and the incredible life lessons in it. Let's dig in. So at the top of the show this week, you heard a warning that you have never heard in this podcast in nearly 10 years, literally never on this show, which is an adult content warning. Now, why would I do that? Well, this podcast has been officially listed as a clean show since day one, every single episode. You've never heard me cuss. You've never heard really any kind of adult content at all. This show has remained clean in that sense. However, the episode this week is a direct feature of David Goggins' latest book. Um, I previously featured a discussion of his first book, Can't Hurt Me, uh, on the show. And in that particular review of the book, I managed to work around his language and around his content a little bit. I'm not going to do that in this episode. So there is a warning for a reason, which is that I'm going to quote David directly and use the language that he uses and discuss the content that he discusses. And I'm going to do so for two reasons. The first of which is that I want to be true to David's story and tell it the way that he tells it. And the second is that there is power in authenticity. There is absolute power in experiencing real life as it really is. In other words, not lying to yourself about reality. And in some ways, when I gloss over harsh language or adult-themed content, I'm actually negating part of real life. Uh, you know, I subscribe to HBO, for example. Uh, HBO is a you know a TV directory filled with what I would call adult content, and it's one of the things that I think is part of life that it's it is glossed over, it is ignored, and there is so much of real life that brings out real value. And David's story is one of the most rigorously authentic stories you'll ever hear. You may not like his story the way he tells it. You may find him to be offensive. He's got a lot of haters, no doubt. But he's got a fan base that's more passionate than I've probably ever seen. And so from that perspective, I will kind of raise my hand here and say that I'm in the fan camp of David Goggins. I think he's amazing. I think his books are incredible. His life story is powerful. And there's a lot to be gained from from him. And so I want to share uh, both my passion for David and his work uh, and and life story, uh, but also to do so in an authentic way. So this is your warning. I've talked long enough now about that. If you want to to pass on the episode and come back next Monday, that is totally fine. I will see you then. Um, But if you're ready to dig in and do some, some more hardcore work, let's do this, right? Here we go. So are you ready this week, right now, To fight your demons. There are few people on the planet, if any at all, who can match the raw intensity and tenacity of David Goggins. His latest book, Never Finished, is a testament to his unrelenting pursuit of human potential. He asked the questions, you know, what are we capable of? Can't we do more? Isn't there a higher level to pursue and achieve? But the funny thing is, David doesn't just stop there with asking the question. He seeks out the answer and does so in a way that, honestly, I don't know many people on planet Earth who do what he does in his attempt to answer that question. What am I capable of? What can I do? Can I push the envelope and do so in a way that will blow past my previously held limitation? That glass ceiling that I thought was there, David just busts through it in ways that will just blow your mind. 
So his latest book, Never Finished, Unshackle Your Mind and Win the War Within, is a deeper dive into the mindset of David Goggins. His first book, Can't Hurt Me, really gives you his backstory, his childhood, uh, a lot of the trauma he experienced there. And then as that moves into some of the bigger, you know, ultra marathons that he ran in his military uh, career, there's a lot of that discussion in the first book. It's a phenomenal book. Definitely read it. But the second one uh, is, I would argue, is at a higher level, a deeper level of really understanding his motivation and his rationale for doing what he does, which is powerful. And it is the kind of story that there is a lot to pull from. The kind of story that provides so much that we can then implement in our own lives to take our own goals to the next level. So for the episode this week, what I have done is extracted eight direct quotations from the book. I will read the quotation word for word as it's written, and then I will share some thoughts I have on it. Uh, The intention for the episode this week is both to convince you to buy the book, of course, because it's great, and read it because it's great. Uh, but also to really ask the bigger questions for yourself. What does it mean for you to pursue a bigger goal? What does it mean for you to take your life to the next level? And are you the kind of person that needs a smack in the face? And I say that respectfully. Uh, What I mean by that is is that sometimes we need a wake-up call. Sometimes we need to be dunked into ice-cold water to wake us up. And I think in many ways, that's what these books are. David's story is an ice bath, right? It's the kind of experience where you can't ignore it. And once you've heard it, you're just like, oh my gosh, like my eyes are open now. I'm listening. So that's what this is. All right. Quotation number one. David says, I was too distracted by child abuse, neglect, and racist taunts to see all the fucked up things in my life over which I had direct influence. So to paraphrase what he just said, this is in the intro of the book where he is talking about essentially, once again, his childhood, his trauma that he experienced. And David experienced child abuse, neglect, and extreme racism. And those things caused him to be distracted, right? To experience uh, intense abuse, neglect, racism. These very difficult, just extraordinary challenges. You can imagine that most people who experience these kinds of things will carry that with them for their whole life. And I'm sure David will always carry those things with him as well. But his realization was that those things were distractions. He uses that word, which is interesting because on this podcast, I discuss productivity and I discuss the idea that if you're working on your job day to day, you're nine to five doing your thing and you're distracted by Facebook, distracted by a text message, distracted by, you know, the mailman's here again. Okay, fine. Those are actual distractions. But what if your distractions are deeper? What if your distractions are past trauma? How does that impact your day? How does that impact the choices you make going forward? How does that impact the choices you make to pursue something new if you're going to live in the past your whole life? Now, I'm not a therapist. I'm not going to give advice here on how to overcome these kinds of of personal challenges. If, uh, If therapy is part of your solution, there is no way I will talk you out of that. It's a great thing. But there is an interesting take that David has here, which is that if these past experiences, these past traumas become distractions, that cause you to not be able to see the elements of your life over which you have direct influence, direct control, you miss opportunities in the here and now to do more and better work. That's the thing. Whether you're distracted by the mailman or distracted by a past trauma, both of those things might hold you back from choosing to do the next best choice, the next best action that things that you have control over that will push you forward. One of the things I focus on this podcast a lot is how the show ends every week. And I say this every week that you have the power to change your life and the fun begins bright and early. But that first part that you have the power to change your life says that despite your current challenges, despite your current season, despite what you may be experiencing, you have power, you have choice. You have influence, you have control. You may not have as much as you want, 
you may not have it all. In fact, I've had many seasons, especially these last few years for me, where this has been really tough. I mean, between COVID and having two young kids for the first time in my life and experiencing a number of different personal and and business challenges, these last few years for me have been filled with opportunities for me to make excuses. That's right. Filled opportunities for me to not acknowledge the control that I actually have, to not take control over the life that I'm living. I make excuses too. This is not a story to point fingers to anyone. I am doing that to myself that I am distracted by past trauma. And so I have to ask myself these questions. How can I take the reins again and have direct control to move my life forward? This is a powerful question. Honestly, it's a pretty harsh beginning to this conversation, but it is where David came from, right? He has come from a world where that's kind of a foundation for him. It's a foundation of abuse and neglect. And that's that's a tough place to begin. And if that's your story or you've experienced something recently that has laid a strong cloud around your life, it becomes the, the difficult question to ask, but one that must be asked, which is what can I do despite what I'm experiencing? Or maybe because of, right? What can I do? This becomes very important. All right, quotation number two. David says, no matter how badass and successful you think you are, trust me, there is a semi coming around a blind curve ready to smack you in the fucking mouth when you are comfortable as all hell. Whew, that's a big one. I'm going to say this one one more time. No matter how badass and successful you think you are, trust me, there is a semi coming around a blind curve ready to smack you in the fucking mouth when you are comfortable as all hell. David hates comfort. (laughs) He hates comfort. He has a just, it's a fanatical hatred of things that would cause you to feel good. I think he really does. He finds a fascination in pushing himself to such a degree that he also has a very realistic perspective that when you are comfortable, when you are successful, When you have experienced really great things, it is so easy to look at your past trophies. It's so easy to look at your bank accounts, so easy to look at your house, your stuff, your experiences, to look at your life in a way that says, I'm fine. Things are good. Things are great. I'm I'm, I'm set. What he is really explaining in, in more detail in the book is that there are these dangerous, awful things that could come your way. And when you get comfortable and then those things happen, you're not prepared for them. You have let your guard down. And I don't share the same kind of intensity David does around this topic, but I think it is one that's very interesting, which is that David comes from a world where really awful things have happened to him in in numerous ways, much more so than I am. I feel very, you know, grateful for the fact that my life doesn't share the same level of, of trauma and intensity. But I I still understand logically and emotionally what he's talking about. Bad things do happen. And to be prepared for future bad things is a noble uh, pursuit. To have the skills to be able to handle those, the mentality to handle uh, the, the changes, the ebbs and flows of life. It also flows into the idea that when we reach a finish line in life, right, a success in our life, it's pretty easy to sit back. And just kind of accept the the rewards of that hard work. And what David argues, which I'll get to here in a minute, is that he doesn't find any value in finish lines. He finds them to be a temporary distraction. And then he's off and running to the next thing. The, the book is called Never Finished for a Reason, which is that from his perspective, there is no finish line. We are always in pursuit of the next thing. And so there's an interesting story or, I guess, theme that plays out here, which is that if you are in the perspective that you have rested or are currently resting in your past successes, that could be a problem. 
I remember a story from Shaquille O'Neal, the NBA star who had many years of great success. And one of the stories I heard from him a long time ago was that you know he would get these trophies from his you know massive championships and, and awards he was given. And if I'm, I have the story correct, his father would basically allow him to keep the trophy, the award, the you know this amazing thing for a short time whether it's a week, a month, whatever the case was. And then his father would take it from him, <laughs> take it from Shaq, and his father would keep it. But Shaquille was not allowed to experience that for very long because the intention was, okay, great, we'll acknowledge the award, acknowledge the success, and then we're going to move on to the next thing. I think that's a healthy perspective. Acknowledge success, be in it, right? emote and feel the goodness of it, but be prepared to go fight the next day. There is value there. Quotation number three, uh, David says, I wasn't training to gain any longer. I had become a maintenance man. And while it's certainly possible to maintain muscle tone and a certain level of cardiovascular fitness, you cannot maintain the savage mind. The savage mind is a major topic in this book, and it's one that really defines his mentality. David views himself as a savage, which is a, an intentional word choice that he is using to view himself as a, a guy who has a primal force. And that primal force is the thing that keeps him you know, in the hunt, on the move, ready for that next challenge, that thing that says, here I go, like I am, I'm ready to tackle this next thing. And what he's discussing here is very similar to the last point, which is that it's easy to rest in your comfort, in your past successes, but it's also easy to rest in maintenance, to be stuck in a place where you're not going backwards, things aren't bad, but you're also not going forward, right? You're in this rhythm, possibly even a rat race, right, where you feel like every day is about the same, you maintain your status quo, you keep your health at an okay level, keep your finances at an okay level, you know, things are just kind of okay. From David's perspective, and this is one that I've shared for a long time on the show, is that that's a very dangerous place to be. Maintenance is extraordinarily dangerous because there's only one place that it leads, which is backwards. You might think, well, maintenance keeps you where you are, but it doesn't. Because the mantra that if you're not growing, you're dying, it is absolutely true. Maintenance is a delayed form of decay. Because over time, you're not going to actually grow. Uh, do you need a savage mind like David Goggins? No, probably not. Right? He is more extreme, for sure. He is an outlier of the outliers. He is very, very much the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. So I'm not going to say that David is the living example of what this means, but I think his story here really plays out that if we get stuck in this world of maintenance, of comfort, of success, of doing the same thing over and over, and that routine that we're in is not producing better results, we are actively in decay, and that part is dangerous. So then your goal is to get yourself out of that and actually make forward progress, which uh, in the past on this podcast, I discussed James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. And in that book, he talks about the 1% rule, which is very common in the world of you know progress and goal achievement, which just says you're going to try to get 1% better every day, right? That's it. Not 100%, not 1,000%. It's literally just 1% better. And if your rhythms and your routines are allowing growth, even to as small as 1%, that growth is all you need. So once again, we don't need the savage mind. If you want to go there, knock yourself out. But if your goal is just the 1%, you will be just fine. The long-term exponential growth of that 1% is phenomenal. So focus on that every day, a little bit of growth. The next day, a little bit more. Quotation number four. In this fourth quote, uh, David was talking to a guy on the side of the road because David was out for a run and a driver pulled up next to him, recognized him and started a conversation while this guy is driving and David is running. And so the guy in the car says, dude, why are you even out here on a day like this? David says, I shrugged and shook my head because you're not. So David is making, and this is a funny story too, because I have experienced this, not directly to the point of someone driving next to me and knowing who I am, but to the point of acknowledging that David was out for a long run on a super hot day, 
right? The guy pulled over because he was amazed that David was out in this extraordinary heat in the desert. It was this ridiculous story. But the point that David is making is that he was out there pushing himself because other people aren't doing so. I think one of David's motivations is to strive for things on purpose because nobody else will do it. That he's actually going to pursue things simply because it needs to be done from his perspective. That if someone else is not doing it, that's a problem and he's going to go solve it. One aspect of this that I've experienced personally is let's uh, say, for example, I'm going to go for a long trail run, which I like to do usually on the weekends or on Fridays, take the day off. And I'll go to a trail here in Nashville. And right now it's the winter. So the weather is colder. It's a little bit snowy sometimes. I mean, Tennessee has pretty bad weather in the Tennessee version of that, which is not bad at all, <laughs> which means if I go to a state park, which I, I go to frequently, and I'll go to on a, on a day when it's probably just above freezing, I'll be the only person there, literally the only person in a state park on a Saturday morning out for a trail run. And it blows my mind. And I think to myself often, I'm so glad I'm here because no one else is. Not because I want to be alone, but because I'm willing to do something that someone else is not willing to do or a lot of someone's are not willing to do. Now, yes, people may have lives and schedules. and They didn't have time to go to the park that day, except when you realize the very next weekend when the weather is what much better, all of a sudden the park is filled with people. The weather was the excuse. The weather was the reason. The temperature being bad, the, the clouds, the cold, the snow, the rain, whatever, the excuses just piled in. So no one showed up. They had something they would rather do that, once again, was more comfortable. But if you're on a mission to do something, in my case, it usually is to train for a marathon, to, to challenge myself physically and mentally. Well, weather for me is not an excuse. Weather for me is not a thing I even consider except to make sure my outfit matches what the weather is going to bring that day. But that's it. Other than that, I'm still going to be there. The weather is not going to stop my progress. And so when you find yourself in that scenario where you're saying no to something because this know, easy excuse showed up, well, you have the opportunity to do something that others are not willing to do, which means you get results others are not going to get. That's the opportunity is to recognize those moments in your life when you could be that guy in the park by yourself on a cold, difficult day or a super hot, challenging whatever. Fill in your example here of an opportunity for you to jump into something where you have previously decided not to do it, and you can overcome that. Quotation number five. David says, it's all well and good to have success and reach a certain level, but I really don't give a fuck what you did yesterday. Maybe you finished Ultraman or graduated from Harvard. I do not care. Respect is earned every day by waking up early, challenging yourself with new dreams or digging up old nightmares and embracing the suck like you have nothing and have never done a damn thing in your life. Ouch. <laughs> That's a harsh statement. This is one that I read and reread like six times in a row because it was the passage that really said, David doesn't care what you did in the past. And what he's saying is not that he doesn't care, right? He, he's a good guy. He respects people. But what he's saying is yesterday was yesterday, man. Today is today. The future is the future, but what you have is right now. Your past successes, once again, this is a, a common theme here. Your past successes, your Harvard graduations, your ultra marathons you're running, or what are these things are you've done? These You're resting on your laurels, essentially. I don't care. Uh, today is a new day. It's time to, to chase those demons, to embrace these difficult old challenges and fight through them. He calls it embracing the suck. This is a common thing that there is a, a ton of value that can be gained from doing something you don't want to do. I heard a quote recently from someone, I forget exactly who it was, 
who was talking about the idea that when there is something you are a little scared of, when there's an area of your life where you feel like, ooh, I don't want to do that, and your, your natural inclination is to go, ooh, that's not for me, you're going to get more benefit from that thing than anyone else because you don't want to do it, because it sounds hard, because it sounds like the kind of thing that scares you away. That's the perfect thing to lean into. That's the reason to go do it. That's where the growth takes place. Yes, your success is earned every day, but your success is also earned by leaning into things you definitely don't want to do. David is really hardcore about this. He is the epitome of hardcore, but I think that this mantra holds true for all of us every single day. So years ago, I heard this quotation from Darren Hardy, the past publisher of Success Magazine, where he said that the rent is due every day. Now, that was his phrase, right? That you have to get up and go earn the money again today. Get up and do the work again today. But today is a new day. And that's both exhausting <laughs> and also uh, very uplifting because it's very it's, it's hopeful and, and, and what it is because it means that today is a new opportunity. Your past, if it was bad, forget it. If it was great, forget it. Today is a new day to go re-earn your level of success and achievements. And it can be the kind of thing that can be daunting, but what you're looking for here is a rhythm of life. Once again, this kind of cyclical nature of re-embracing difficult challenges and finding joy in that challenge. That's, for me, why I was able to run marathons and ultra marathons for so many years in a row uh, without ever really viewing it as difficult because I got into a rhythm where the challenge of pushing myself further was just more gratifying than the past challenge, that every single time I had the opportunity to push harder, it was awesome. Like that's when you know you're in a great place. It's not this real military, just life is awful, go do it anyway mentality. You can view it that way. But my perspective is you get to go do something that's going to make you better and the journey is awesome. Isn't that fantastic? I want to flip this from David's maybe possibly way too negative perspective to one that is much more hopeful, one that is much more embracing of what if. What if today could be that much more amazing? What if today could be my big breakthrough? I feel like there's so much to be gained from, from that kind of perspective. Quotation number six, when you're climbing a mountain or involved in any other difficult task, the only way to free yourself from the struggle is to finish it. So why bitch about it when it gets hard? Why hope it will end soon when you know it will end eventually? When you complain and your mind starts groping for the eject button, you are not bringing your best self to the task, which means you are actually prolonging the pain. This one hit me in a unique place because this is one that I think speaks to our day-to-day -day kind of challenges of working through something hard. Um, I'll use the example recently in my life of, of being, once again, a new dad of two young girls and, and going through COVID and having uh, us personally as a family had a lot of challenges around daycares and finding a place for our daughters to go to school and and all of the just the, the challenges that come from having kids that are young. We experienced those things pretty, you know, head on. Like it was just that's all we've been doing all day, every day. Tessa and I thinking through how do we figure out how to be great parents, how to keep our kids in, in great schools, uh, how to maintain our own careers and sanity and health, right? These life challenges that are very real for us right now. One thing that's extremely easy to do is to bitch about these problems, like David just said, to complain, to find yourself stuck in that mode of wanting the eject button, of wanting to get out, right? Because it feels too hard and it feels like it never stops, that every single day is not an opportunity. Every single day is an exhausting beatdown. That's not life. Right? That's just a bad season. This is the thing that he hits on that really stuck out to me. This too shall pass. This will end eventually. This is not forever. Your current season is not forever. It will end. Everything does, which is amazing. Because it means that the pain you're going through, the challenge you're experiencing, it's going to end. This is not going to last forever. And so his intent here, his, his goal is to say, 
well, okay, if this is going to end eventually and I can stop complaining in the moment, well, then I can actually bring about my best self to not only experience this in a healthier way, but potentially not prolong the pain, potentially end the pain sooner by pushing myself through this difficult challenge, which we've all experienced. You're going through a hard project or you're doing a hard workout. If you work harder, faster, bring your best self, stay focused, stay in the moment, stay positive, you utilize those strategies, well, oftentimes you end the workout sooner, feeling better with better results. It's a good thing. The whole thing works out well, but the opposite is also true. If you decide that this is not going to be for you, that this is just going to be a a sucky experience, then that's the result that you get to, right? The way you view your experience is your experience. Your perception is your reality. Your mindset is what the thing becomes, so when you shift the way you think, you shift the the approach you take to the challenge, then you get the appropriate and better response from that. All right, quotation number seven. David says, if you want to maximize minimal potential and become great in any field, you must embrace your savage side and become imbalanced, at least for a period of time. You'll need to funnel every minute of every single day into the pursuit of that degree, that starting spot, that job, that edge. Your mind must never leave the cockpit. Sleep at the library or the office. Hoop long past sundown and fall asleep watching film of your next opponent. There are no days off and there is no downtime when you are obsessed with being great. That is what it takes to be the baddest motherfucker ever at what you do. I love this. (laughs) I really, really love this entire thing. And I love it because there's there's so much to pull from here. Uh, First of all, what he's talking about is is greatness, right? Becoming great in your field of study, becoming uh, what he calls the baddest motherfucker ever at what you do. That's incredible. There is a lot to be said about what it means to say greatness is my pursuit. Now, his intensity here and his actual his discussion of imbalance is fascinating because just last week on the show, I discussed this idea of batching and living an unbalanced lifestyle and this idea of focusing on one thing at a time and your calendar is you know epically centered around one specific obsession, maybe if you use that word. And then because of that, you get better results. That's all this is. It's just committing to the idea, the thing that you are focused on, the, the pursuit that you have decided to pursue is worth it, and it's worth it to such a degree you're all in. You are absolutely all in. You're going to give what it takes to make this thing successful. Now, he says there are no days off, no downtime. You are obsessed with this. You are 100% in. There's two ways to take that as well. The first is that there's no days off. Isn't that exhausting? Isn't that terrible? I need a break. I'm going to die. I'm going to burn out. (laughs) It's bad. But the opposite for me is what tends to be true. The reason why there's no days off is because you're so bought into it, you don't want to stop. Right? It's not that someone is dragging you through these experiences. Right? That's not what this is. This is not a forced experience. You are opting into this. This is something you are dying to do. You would l- literally like give up a ton of stuff, sacrifice so much, possibly everything, because you are just so fascinated with what this next project is, this next goal is, this career move. You're just in love with it. And when you're in love with something, no, there's no days off. That love is always there. That desire to push forward is always there. I find that to be more more uplifting, but also more actionable for me because the last thing I want to do is is take the perspective that, oh my gosh, there's no days off. I'm just going to die here, right? I would much rather take the perspective of, man, I'm so bought in. Isn't this amazing? Let's go again. And to me, that's where the value really shows up. All right, the final quotation, number eight this week, from David Goggins' book, Never Finished. David says, most people live their whole lives without ever contemplating what it means to be great. They put all the greats on a pedestal, but think of themselves as mere mortals. And that's exactly why greatness eludes them. No matter what I'm doing or which arena I'm engaging in, 
I will always aim for greatness because I know that we are all mere mortals and greatness is possible for anyone and everyone if they are willing to seek it out in their own soul. You do have the power to change your life. Uh, David is correct in this idea that we all have the ability, we all can be great, and that it is, it absolutely is our own mental limitations that hold us back from doing the next big thing. If you live your life with this assumption, this false assumption that greatness is meant for someone else, then it always will be. That's the truth. Greatness is not for someone else unless you think that it is. It is for you once you make the choice to say, I'm in, I'm doing this. This past limitation was only in my mind. What I'm doing going forward is a new thing. I have a new mantra, a new calendar, a new focus, and one that acknowledges the fact that greatness is within you and you can pursue more of it and actually experience it and then ultimately cross that finish line of what it means for you to achieve greatness. This all sounds kind of hyperbolic in the way that I am kind of phrasing this right now, but what I really, the way that I view this is it says, if there's something you have ignored delayed, postponed, uh, intentionally said, no, I I can't do that because I don't have X, Y, Z. I'm missing the money, the time, the skills. Insert excuse here. There's something you want and you know you want it, but you've allowed all the other BS to hold you back. This is your chance to just say, forget all that stuff. I'm in. I'm excited. I I pulled into this and I'm going to achieve this because it means a lot to me. Now you can fill in that blank with whatever you want in terms of your pursuit of whatever greatness means to you. This is totally open. This is your life. These are your choices. But if you make the choice to say greatness is for someone else, then it always will be the case. But the opposite is true. That if you decide greatness is for me, then it is. So go do it. Go live it. Go make it happen. And for the action step this week, you know what it is. Read this book. In fact, read both books, Can't Hurt Me and Never Finished by David Goggins. Both of these books are remarkable. They're shocking. They're intense. Yes, they are graphic. Yes, they are. There's no holding back. But these things will absolutely motivate you to take your life to the next level. I I would love to hear your thoughts on these too. Once again, you can email me, jeff at jeffsanders.com. You also find links to these books on the show notes page at jeffsanders.com slash 478. And of course, subscribe to this podcast in the app you're using right now. And you know what? That's all I've got this week. Uh, It was fun chatting about this book. I'll I'll, I'll do more of these in the future. Uh, But until then, you have the power to change your life. Yes, you do. And all that fun begins bright and early.